Okay, uh, good afternoon, Year 10. Welcome back. We are now at part two, possibly the final part, I'm not sure yet, of Act 4, Scene 3 of Shakespeare's Macbeth. Uh, I'll go through uh, the summary of what, what, we, what we've read so far and just remind you of where we've got up to so far. Um, so we'll, we'll start by looking at the summary. We'll, look, we'll talk a little bit about what we've read so far and then we'll try and get towards the end of the scene. We're about halfway through the scene. I did say it's a lengthy scene, uh, this one, but it is important in, in, in the context of the whole play. Uh, this is also the final scene in Act 4 before we have the kind of tragic downfall of Act 5. Act 5 is... Uh, uh, it, it, the plot really does accelerate even f quicker and even further towards its uh, tragic ending. Okay, so when towards the end of Act Four, we're starting on Act Five soon. Um, but this is again a lesson on Act Four, Scene Three. So part two of Act Four, Scene Three. So let's have a look at the summary again. Just remind ourselves of where we left off. I just wanted to emphasize before we carry on with the scene, just a reminder, here's the scene, here's a, a, a picture of the scene from one of the productions of Macbeth, that this is all about the fact that Malcolm has been testing Macduff, testing his loyalty, testing his noble nature. And we're at the point in the dialogue where Malcolm will reveal to Macduff that he's in fact passed the test and he'll welcome him uh, into his rebel army, which will march upon Scotland shortly. So we're literally at the point where Malcolm reveals that he's in fact been uh, performing and pretending to be a more vile and more violent tyrant than Macbeth. So as we did before, I'm chunking this scene into different into different sections, different segments. So this next segment has been quite brief. This is the reveal, as you can see on my page, where Malcolm uh, reveals that he's actually been uh, t tricking and, and testing Macduff and that Macduff has passed the test. So I'll read this out and then I'll we'll have a quick checkpoint. So Malcolm says, Mal uh, Macduff, this noble passion, child of integrity, hath from my soul wiped the black scruples, reconciled my thoughts uh, to thy good nature and honour. Devilish Macbeth, by many of these trains, hath sought to win me into his power, and modest wisdom plucks me, plucks me from over-prejudice haste. But God above deal between thee and me, for even now I put myself to thy direction, and speak, unspeak mine own detraction. Here abjured taints and blames I laid upon myself for strangers to my nature. I am yet unknown to woman, never was forsworn, scarcely have coveted that what was mine own, and at no time broke my faith, would not betray the devil to his fellow, and delight no less in truth than life. My first false speaking was this upon myself. What I am truly is thine, and my poor country's to command. Whither indeed before thy here approach, old Seward, with ten thousand warlike men, already at a point, was setting forth. Now all together, and the chance of goodness be like our warranted quarrel. Why are you silent? And Macduff responds, such welcome and unwelcome things at once, tis hard to reconcile. Which is fair enough, he's been completely baffled. Let's have a look at this in more detail. I'm going to go over quite quickly elements of this, and then spend a bit more time on the most important section. What he means here in this kind of use of metaphor is that Macduff's noble passion has cleared his mind from doubts. That's what he means. He says it's cleared his mind from doubts, it's wiped away any doubts that he has about Macbeth. He says it's reconciled his thoughts to his good truth and honour. So essentially, uh, Macduff has passed the test uh, and he's seen and perceived to be trustworthy by Malcolm. Malcolm then tells and informs Macduff and the audience, I suppose, that Macbeth has uh, sought to win him several times into his power. So essentially, Macbeth has been plotting to try and trick Malcolm into coming back to Scotland, which is interesting because, again, it emphasises the theme of tyranny. Um, and then he goes on to talk about uh, how he's essentially going to unspeak, and which means go back on everything he's just said. So he's going to he's going to re repent of what he's just said, um, and he's going to reveal who he actually is. So he says, you know, I've, I've been a stranger to myself, to my own nature. 
And then we've got this reveal about Malcolm's true qualities, which I do want to spend a bit more time on. Um, and I'll just go through what he means first and then talk about the significance. Firstly, he says, I am yet unknown to woman. So he's being, again, it's a bit, a bit euphemistic, but he means he's a virgin. He says he's never forsworn, so he's not told a lie, so he's truthful. Okay, I'm just going to list the qualities. He then says he scarcely covered what was mine own, so he is, uh, he is humble. He, he doesn't, he's not greedy. Okay, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not avaricious, he's not greedy, he's content with what he has. Um, he then says he's never broken his faith, so he's, again, he's a devout Christian, he's faithful. Uh, and he delights no less in truth than life. So, he, and he, again, just going back over this idea of him being virtuous, okay. So, in actual fact, oh, and lastly, sorry, he says he wouldn't betray the devil to his fellow. So he's saying he's loyal as well. So if you look at this list of qualities that he's just revealed about himself, he's faithful, truthful, uh, virginal, humble, virtuous, and loyal. These are all kingly qualities. These are all qualities of a great king, of a good king. Uh, so it's, int it's important that, you know, he's, he's actually revealing to Macduff that I am a good king. I'm a noble king. I'm a virtuous king. I'm essentially just like my father is what he's essentially saying. Um, and therefore, Macduff can trust him to be a good king if he were to depose of Scotland, uh, Scotland's current king, which is Macduff, which he intends to do. He says, "My poor country's command is where I need to be. Is where I need to be now." And what he means by that is he needs to take leadership uh, and take hold of Scotland and reclaim Scotland. So he's going to reclaim Scotland and depose Macbeth, usurp the throne from him, and then. He notices that he repeats this idea about England providing him with 10,000 men and he notices Macduff's reaction, which is kind of silence. And Macduff says it's welcome and unwelcome things at once. It's hard to reconcile. So it's kind of almost like cognitive dissonance for, Macb for Macduff, which means he, it's almost like having two opposite thoughts in, the, in your head at the same time. And he can't decide, he can't work out which thought to have. That marks, I know that's quite a short passage, but that marks our first checkpoint. So I'd like you to explain to summarize your understanding of Malcolm's reveal in your own words, that should take you about 10 minutes. So please pause the video and go over that speech again, go over your notes and summarize your understanding of it for me, please. See you soon. Welcome back. So we now have a shift in the scene. A doctor enters, and I've got an illustration from Act 4, Scene 3 on the screen for you. A doctor enters and he is a very minor character. He literally de delivers about four or five lines of dialogue. And he just reveals to the audience uh, information about the King of England, who remember is Edward the Confessor, uh, which is we talked about why Edward the Confessor is referred to in the play. Uh, it's this idea that he's a heroic king who's going to rescue Scotland from tyranny. Then you have another character entering once the doctor's delivered his, his lines. Um, and that's that's Ross, who you would recognise now as the nobleman. He's the same nobleman, to be really clear. I think we can get mixed up with Lennox and Ross. He's the same nobleman who came to visit Lady Macduff in Act 4, Scene 2, and to warn her. Uh, he seems to, you know, he seems to become, have become disillusioned with Macbeth's reign and is stirring people into rebellion. And Ross arrives, and in this scene, Ross will um, reveal to, eventually reveal to Macduff the news of his family's slaughter. And it's a very powerful, very emotive, very uh, a, a scene full of pathos, uh, and you know, for, we really pity for. Uh, Pity Macduff when he finds out about this slaughter. It's a really poignant and poetic scene in terms of the use of language by Shakespeare. Okay, as I've said before, I've, I've chunked, and I've, as you're well aware, I've chunked the scene into different segments. So I'm going to read from where a doctor enters up here to, towards the end of the next page. So up until Matt, uh, Ross says, your iron Scotland would create soldiers. So that's where I'm going to read up to initially, and then we'll have a close reading of this section of the play. Okay, so, Malcolm, uh, sorry, en enter a doctor, Malcolm. Well, more anon, comes the king forth, I pray you. Aye, sir, there are a crew of wretched souls that stay his cure. Their malady convinces the great assay of art, but at his touch, such sanctity hath heaven given his hand. They presently amend. I thank you, doctor. So, very short line for the doctor. Exit, doctor. What's the disease he means? Tis called the evil, a most miraculous work in this good king, which often since my here remain in England I have seen him do. How he solicits heaven, himself best knows, but strangely visits the people, all swollen and ulcerous, pitiful to the eye, the mere despair of surgery. He cures, hanging a golden stamp about their necks, put on with holy prayers, and tis spoken to the succeeding royalty he leaves the healing benediction. 
with this strange virtue he hath a pleasant a heavenly gift of prophecy and sundry uh blessings hang about his throne that speak him full of grace enter ross i'm just gonna move my book sorry enter ross who comes here my countryman but yet i know him not my ever gentle cousin welcome thither i know him now good god the times remove that the means that make us strangers sir amen stands scotland where it did alas poor country almost afraid to know itself it cannot be called our mother but our graves where nothing but who knows nothing is once seen to smile where sighs and groans and shrieks that rend the air are made not marked where violent sorrow seems a modern ecstasy the dead man's knell is there scarce asked for who and good men's lives expire before the flowers in their caps dying or ere they sicken oh relation too nice and yet too true what's the newest grief that's when hour's age doth hiss the speaker each minute teems a new one how does my wife uh, why well and all my children well too the tyrant is not battered at their peace no they were well at peace when i did leave them be not a niggard of your speech how goes it when i came hither to transport the tidings which i have heavily borne there ran a rumour of many worthy fellows that were out which was to my belief witness the rather for that i saw the tyrant's power afoot now is the time of help your eye in scotland would create soldiers make our women fight to doff their dire distress and that's our checkpoint we'll leave it there at that line there okay let's have a look at the scene in a bit more detail let's go back to the doctor entering let's trace in my page view we talked already about how the doctor uh, has very few lines uh, he comes in briefly delivers four lines and then departs the lines he delivers are all in relation to Edward the confessor so I'll put King Edward uh, who is the King of England we've talked about how he's presented as being uh, he's presented as being fair virtuous and pious and what's going on outside of the palace walls is that the, there's a wretched crew of souls that stay his cures. That means that there are people who are wretched, who are ill and sick, who are waiting for the king to arrive to, to be healed. So it's an, another interesting kind of addition to this, to the way that we've, to the, to the information we've learnt about King Edward the Confessor, in that he's presented as being pious and in this scene almost Christ-like, in that he's literally capable of healing the sick, healing the uh, injured. So he's presented in almost quite Christ-like way in that sense. And that kind of, you know, is, is not surprising given the fact that he achieved the status, status of a saint. So, um, he essentially delivers that news that the king is curing the sick. Uh, Malcolm thanks him. Macduff asks what's the disease that he means. And Malcolm then says it's called the evil and most miraculous work in this good king. And we have more flattery of King Edward the Confessor. Uh, we're told that he is able to, uh, he's able to cure the despair of surgery he's able to cure swellings ulcers uh, he, things that are pissful to the eye so again just to go over that idea that edward the confessor is presented as again a savior like figure in the play we don't meet him as a character but he's we, we hear word of him and then the rest of this speech is essentially a, a, a description of the healing powers and the holiness of edward then we have ross enter uh, and ross's entry is strange because Ross clearly knows about the death of or the murder rather of Macduff's family but he doesn't actually tell Macduff straight away he's withholding that information and the information that he does give to Macduff and to Malcolm is is prompted by the question Macduff asks him which is stand Scotland where it did so what's is Scotland still in the same situation it was in when I left it and again notice how it's personified again and that's a, a motif uh, Ross says, "Alas, poor country." And this is a, this is the interesting shriek, uh, the interesting shriek, the interesting section. Um, we have this very again vivid description of tyranny and oppression and suffering uh, in Scotland. So Ross continues, "Alas, poor country, uh, it cannot be called our mother, but our graves." Uh, and it's kind of an exa example of hyperbole or exaggeration here. But what he means is metaphorically, Scotland is no longer a mother figure. It's no longer a figure of you know, a maternal nurturing figure, it's now their grave. So it's, it's, been, it's been transformed into, from, from one thing which was nourishing into another that was the opposite. Um, so Scotland is now a grave, and that is again a vivid image to describe the state of Scotland under Macbeth. He then, in a very similar way to how, Mac, uh, to how Duncan, and not Duncan, sorry, to how um, Malcolm did earlier, and Ross did earlier, 
Uh, he then describes the noises and the auditory imagery. So we've got sighs, groans, shrieks, and we've got lots of you know these powerful verbs and examples of auditory imagery that are obviously you know used to emphasise the suffering that's that's taking place in Scotland, the agony of that's that the Scottish people are confronting. Uh, and it's interesting that they're made, these sounds are all made, but they're not marked. So the implication being here that Scotland is so full of suffering that people are no longer taking any notice of it. It's, it's, it's become almost commonplace. People have become desensitised in a way to the suffering that they're hearing. He continues his state where violent sorrow seems a modern ecstasy. So he's, he's saying that violence and sorrow seem to be commonplace now. The dead men's knell is there scarce to ask for who? And that's an interesting, the syntax of that, the order of that sentence is a bit confusing. It's another example of metaphor. Uh, and what he means here is that the, the sound of the dead man's funeral, so, so that presumably the knell is the bell of the, of the church, the sound of the church bell is no longer heard uh, and, no, and no one notices uh, or asks who's died anymore. So essentially he's talking about how death is consuming Scotland. Uh, and obviously these are deaths that are caused by Macbeth. Uh, so there's basically a bloodbath yeah, taking place in Scotland under Macbeth's tyranny. Uh, he then, again, to underline and underscore the point, creates another metaphor. He says, good men's lives expire before the flowers in their caps. They die or sicken. And what he means here is that, it's fairly obvious, I think, but he's talking about how short-lived men's lives are. They, they live for shorter lives as the flowers that they wear in their hats. Uh, so their lives are very short and they're cut short by murder, presumably, is what he means. So, again, that little speech is very important in relation to the theme of tyranny, and it gives you this idea of the, uh, the oppression that, that is uh, happening in, 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 in Scotland. Um, obviously, that Macduff and Malcolm do not receive that news well, and Ross says that an of an hour's age hisses the speaker. So what he means by that is that there's constantly bad news. There's con there's, there are constantly new... Uh, atrocities taking place that meet that makes the t the time seem as if it's you know it, it, as if history is repeating itself over and over again then we have this strange in interaction where or this strange exchange where Macduff asks Ross about his children and he says they're well which I find I still find quite confusing I, I think maybe maybe it's because Ross is really hesitant to deliver this terrible news that he's that he doesn't deliver it straight away that's that's how I would read it I would say it's because he's reluctant to tell Macduff about the atrocity that's taken place uh, at his castle um, and then Ross kind of ignoring the question about Macduff's children then describes the rumor that he's heard and the rumor he's heard is about rebellion and revolt. Okay, so he's heard rumours of rebellion, rumours of revolt, revolt, and then essentially he delivers his core message, which is that uh, he says, "Now is the time of help." Okay, he's he's calling for Malcolm to help him now. It's a, it's almost a bugle call to action here. Now is the time of help. Uh, your iron Scotland will create soldiers, make our women fight to doff their dire distress. He's stirring Malcolm to to rebel now. He, by, by your eye, he means your presence. So he's saying, to, he's saying to Malcolm, your presence in Scotland would make people fight. It would create soldiers. It would create rebellion. Uh, there would be an army of people ready to join you. And he says it, makes, it would make our women fight as well. So clearly his, his aim is to stir Malcolm into action uh, more promptly, maybe more quickly than he was prepared to. But it's, it's, a, it's clearly a call to arms. I'll put that in there. Call to arms. And then, and then we have our checkpoint. So I would like you to take your time now. You have to go back from back to the line, enter a doctor, up until to doff their dire distresses, and just summarise that section of the scene for me. Again, I would take your time. So I'll take a, at least ten minutes or so, and feedback, uh, and come back once you're finished. So please pause the video, and I'll see you again in about ten minutes. Okay, welcome back. On your board, you've got that same artistic in interpretation of this scene. We're coming to the shift in the scene, the, to the development in the scene, that is essentially the climactic moment. This is when Ross finally breaks the news to Macduff that his family have been murdered, uh, savagely slaughtered, as he puts it. Uh, and it, this is the moment that spurs Macduff to, to avenge his family. And it, and it instigates, a, a, I think, a quicker rebellion than might have happened otherwise. It's apt and appropriate that it is Macduff who 
will eventually be the undoing of Macbeth because he uh, he has such a motive to to have Macbeth killed. He's avenging his entire family who have been massacred. So this is Macduff's response to the massacre. It's very emotional, full of pathos. Um, it's a very heart wrenching scene, I think. Uh, just whatever your opinions are of Macduff and his actions previously. So what we'll do is we'll I'll, I'll read it first. Uh, it's very it's quite a short scene. It's about a page and a bit long. And then we'll go through a close reading of this scene and then we're actually going into Act 5 after that. Okay, so I'm carrying on from Malcolm who's going to, about to reveal that he's, he's ready to march with 10,000 English soldiers that have been lent to him by Edward the Confessor. So we're going from this line, be it their comfort. Be it their comfort, we are coming thither. Gracious England hath lent us good Seward and 10,000 men, an older and a better soldier none that's Christendom gives out. Would I could answer this comfort with the like, but I have words that would be howled out in the desert air, where hearing should not latch them. What concern they? The general cause? Was... Or is it a fee grief, due to some single breast? No mind that's honest puts in its share some woe, though the main part pertains to you alone. If it be mine, keep it not from me. Quickly, let me have it. Let not your ears despise my tongue forever, which shall possess them with the heaviest sound that ever yet they heard. Hmm. I guess that's it. Your castle is surprised, your wife and babe savagely slaughtered. To relate this matter were on the quarry of these murdered deer to add the death of you. Merciful heaven! What, man? Ne'er pull your hat upon your brows, give sorry words. The grief that does not speak whispers the overfraught heart and bids it break. My children, too? Wife, children, servants, all that could be found. And I must be from thence. My wife killed too? Let's make medicines of our great revenge to cure this deadly grief. He has no children. All my pretty ones? Did you say all? Oh, hell kites. All? What? All my pretty chickens and their dam at one fell swoop? Disputes like a man. I shall do so, but I must also feel it like a man. I cannot but remember such things were that were most precious to me. Did heaven look on and would t not take their part? Sinful Macduff, they were all struck for thee. Not that I am, not for their own demerits, but for mine. Fell slaughter on their souls. Heaven rest them now. Be this the whetstone of your sword. Let grief convert to anger. Blunt not the heart and rage it. Oh, I could play the woman with mine eyes and brag it with my tongue. But gentle heavens, cut short all intermission. Front to front, bring thou this fiend of Scotland and myself. Within my sword's length, set him. If he escape, heaven forgive him too. This tune goes manly. Come, go we to the king. Our power is ready. Our lack is nothing but our leave. Macbeth is ripe for shaking, and the powers above put on their instruments. Receive what cheer you may. The night is long that never finds the day. And they all exit. Okay, that's the end of Acts 4. So let's have a look at the scene in more detail. We're going from Be It Their Comfort. So we've already discussed, we've discussed already that Malcolm essentially answers, answers Ross's call to arms by confirming that he's already planning on mounting a, on leading a force to Scotland. So that the, the rebellion is in the open, well, it, it, it is underway. They're preparing to uh, march on Macduff's castle, Duntonay. Um, Ross then answers the question that um, that Macduff answered, asked earlier about his family. He, and like I said, I find the delay confusing as well, but I would suggest it, 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 re it represents uh, Ross's reluctance to have to break this awful, awful news. Um, and I think it's, that's manifest and evident in how poetic Ross is in his choice of language here. But I have words that would be howled in the desert air where hearing should not latch them. I think it's a beautifully poetic uh, piece, of la piece of writing from Shakespeare. Uh, my interpretation would would be that he is he's saying that these wa these words are so painful, so agonising that they ought to be howled in the desert air where no one can hear them. Obviously, deserts are you know not populated; they're empty, they're, va they're vast, they're barren, uh, and he could he's saying these words are more fit for them where no one could hear them, uh, but they're, because they're so painful. And Macduff eventually knows you know who do they concern. They concern you and we have this again ross kind of delay it's almost dramatic tension because he's still not revealing to macduff the news and we as an audience of course know the news and we're 
you know, squirming in our seats, as it were. And Macduff, uh, Ross finally says, uh, let not your ears despise my tongue forever, which shall possess them with the heaviest sound that ever yet they heard. And he's really clearly finding this very, very difficult, this, this, this uh, task of informing a man that his family, his wife, his children have been, have been in line, have been massacred. He finds it an incredibly difficult task, as you would. And eventually, um, he does. He, he, des he describes it quite quickly. It kind of runs off the, runs off the tongue. You're cast as surprise. Your wife, babe, savagely slaughtered to relate the matter. Uh, and this idea, I think the alliterative, the sibilance of savagely slaughtered, it's like he's hissing these words out. Uh, it's as if he can't, as if, as if he wants to kind of erase them from his tongue. They're so, they're so repulsive to him, these words, that the castle's been surprised. Wife and babe savagely slaughtered. There's lots of hissing S sounds here. Um, and it's, I think it's interesting in terms of the productions I've seen. I've seen productions where there's a two or three minute pause um, where Macduff contemplates this news. And it's interesting that Malcolm speaks first. He says, merciful heaven, give sorrow words. So he's saying, Make, you know, grieve, say something, uh, give your sorrow some words. And what's obviously fascinating on a psychological level, on a human level, is that Macduff is kind of rendered speechless uh, or rendered inarticulate, I should say. Because, you know, he can't, give these, he can't give this awful deed words. He can't describe his feelings. He can, simply, uh, he can simply utter three or four word sentences. So the first question is, my children too, as if he didn't hear it the first time, wife, children, servants, all. Uh, uh, and then he says, I must be from hence. And I, I, I've le basically he's talking about how he left them behind. My wife killed too. And I think these rhetorical questions create pathos. I think we feel a great sense of sympathy for Macduff as he's trying to clearly process this overwhelmingly awful news, this awful tragic news he, that is essentially informing him that his entire world has been turned upside down in a matter of moments. And all Ross can say is I've said already what I've, what I've had to say. Again, there's a kind of running thread here. Malcolm, again, trying to urge Macduff to grieve and turn his grief into a medicine that will be his great revenge. So I, I would say that this is, again, it's a metaphor, but I think Malcolm is, is urging Macduff to use this, this news to strengthen his sense of anger, to, 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 to force him and urge him into acting uh, and getting his revenge, uh, rather than presumably seeing him lose himself in his own grief. He doesn't, want Ma he doesn't want Macduff to simply crumble here. He wants Macduff to feel uh, galvanized into action, spurred into action. Macduff here has a little piece of dialogue which I think is almost a soliloquy. It's, or it's as if he doesn't really recognize there are other people around him. Uh, he says he has no children and then he's these really sad, I think it's really heartbreaking rhetorical questions and you can see him processing his grief. Um, I'll put that on processing grief. So the questions he asks, all my pretty ones, did you say all, all, at one fell sweep? And that re repetition of the word all, I think, is really, really uh, heart-wrenching and, 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 and gut-wrenching uh, because we, he just simply can't understand the evil. He can't, get, he can't comprehend the heinous and callous nature of Macbeth uh, and to the fact that Macbeth has sunk so low as to massacre innocence. Uh, he didn't think that Macbeth, even Macbeth, was capable of such a terrible deed. Um, you'll notice again, we've seen this earlier, we've got some bird imagery here, uh, and I'll just briefly explain it because it, it helps to explain the metaphor that Macduff is using here. Okay, the first important metaphor is pictured for you on your screens now. That's the quote, it's a one word quote, well, two word quotation really, it's the utterance, O oh, Hellkite. And the Hellkite is pictured for you here. A Hellkite is obviously a kite of hell, so a demonic bird. And he's obviously talking about Macd uh, Macbeth in this sense. And again, it's another example in the play where Macbeth is associated with the devil and with evil. Um, the kite in this sense, a kite is a bird of prey, but it's, it's also a bird that's a scavenger. So kites will often feed off dead bodies. They're kind of carrion birds in a sense, but they're scavengers and they, they, they will attack other birds' nests. And what he means in this sense is what's pictured here. He says, oh, hell kite, um, what all my pretty chickens and their dam? He comp he, metaphorically, he's just comparing his wife uh, and his and his family to chickens that are 
massacred and p picked apart by a predatory bird and that's the that's the ex explanation of the metaphor they've been uh, they are fragile vulnerable helpless creatures that have been brutally attacked and killed um, and I think it's it's quite a poetic description of pretty chickens and their dam this idea that the little chicks and the, and the mother are completely helpless without him and of course he the rooster the male figure has been absent so he's blaming himself as well and Malcolm in response again goads um, and trying to tries to tries to stir Macduff to revenge he says dispute it like a man to challenge this grief use this grief to rivet to avenge your family and Macduff says I shall do so but first I must feel it as a man so he's you know, insisting that he feels this grief he, he has time to process his huge loss and it clearly shakes him to his core as obviously it would lose you know having your family massacred of course which would, sh would shake you to your core uh, he question he questions this idea that he can't even remember those that were most precious to him he's already starting to lose uh, his memories of his family they're already fading from his memory and he's kind of mourning that as well so it's, it's very much you know this is the grief is the key is is core to the subtext here he asks a, rhetor a, couple of, a rhetorical question, he asks, did heaven look on and would not take part? So clearly he's questioning his own faith and he's asking, a, you know, he's talking about, the, you know, the belief in an interventionist God, a God who would intervene and save his family from evil. And, and clearly he's angry at God himself because God, he, he th he's accusing God of just merely looking on and remaining impartial to this act of evil that was, that was uh, committed upon his family. Uh, he then, again, kind of ruminates on his role in this, and of course he abandoned and, and, and neglected his family, as we saw early in the in the play. And he says, "Sin for Macduff, they were all struck for thee." So this, he essentially interprets this as a punishment for his his neglect, his foolishness in leaving his family behind. Uh, and it's a very poetic and very sad scene uh, that he when he describes, you know, they were they were taken for your for my demerits, not. Uh, not not for theirs so he, they were they were basically innocent they had no faults and it was for his demerits that they were taken and once again as we come towards the end of the scene malcolm tries to urge Macduff uh into action and spur him to revenge he says let this be the whetstone of your sword a whetstone is what you use to sharpen a knife so let this grief sharpen your revenge sharpen your sense of hatred uh, spur you to taking revenge on Mac on macbeth let this spur you on essentially let grief convert to anger blunt not the heart and rage it so you've got this metaphorical language where he's saying turn your grieving heart into a into a sharp implement into a into a knife so that you can use it to uh get your revenge on, Mac, on macbeth and here we have a very important moment where macduff uh makes a solemn vow that he will avenge his family that he will uh do everything in his powers to uh have macbeth deposed and it, it obviously foreshadows which means it gives us a clue of what's going to happen later on because i've said many times in this video series that it is macduff who is the avenger in this in this play it is macduff who will kill macbeth in, in a jaw and hold aloft his severed head and declare the traitor to be dead uh, and also he'll crown malcolm as well so he says um cut short all intermissions let's 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 stop wasting time bring me gentle heavens front to front with this fiend of Scotland, and again, Macbeth is now described frequently now as a fiend, as a devil, or a, or a traitor, or a tyrant. So all of these descriptions are negative. All of them reinforce the idea about his tyranny. And he said he wants to be brought face to face. That's what he means by front to front. So essentially, he's foreshadowing the duel that will take place in Act Five later on. Um, he says, "Bring me within a sword's length of him, and if he escape, heaven forgive him too." So. Again, he's committing himself to defeating Macbeth in battle. He's committing himself to avenging his family's demise uh, by ridding Scotland of this tyrant. And Malcolm, uh, Malcolm welcomes these words. He says, this tune makes you sound manly. Come, let's go to the King of England. We're ready uh, and we lack nothing but our leave. So essentially, Malcolm is announcing that they're ready to start marching on England. So this is, a, this is a, a, again, very much moving towards the climactic moment of the play. It's not yet the climactic moment, but it's certainly rising action moving towards that. And then he uses this interesting metaphor, uh, which has everything to do with deposing the king and use and and uh, and getting revenge. He says Macbeth is ripe for the shaking, and of course we, we use that phrase now. It's a modern phrase. He means that Macbeth is ready to be deposed. Okay, he's talking about 
deposing Macbeth as king uh, and replacing him, obviously, with himself. Macbeth is right for shaking and the powers above put on their instruments. And it's, and it's significant, I think, that, that the last part of that sentence, he's saying that the heavens or, you know, the gods, God himself is supporting their uh, side or their cause. And God, it's, it's, it's the kind of classic trope in literature and in history of a, a side claiming that God is on their side. And then we have this kind of evocative and powerful uh, rhyming couplet to give it, give this act and the scene um, a sense of finality. He says, receive what cheer you may, the night is long that never finds a day. Uh, essentially, let's let's make haste, let's make speed to it, to Scotland, the time is now. And thus ends Act 4, Scene 3, and obviously Act 4, we, we've come to the end of Act 4, uh, it's now time for you to read over your, your notes from this scene and to complete your independent tasks. Uh, so I will see you next lesson for Act 5, Scene 1, um, and make sure that you now go on to completing your independent tasks and your Show My Homework quiz. See you next time.